He joined HMS Iron Duke, a frigate under the command of Commander Mark Newland, one of several ships deployed to the Caribbean during the hurricane season in case they are needed for humanitarian purposes. The rest of the time they work with the U.S. Coast Guard on counter-narcotics patrols, stopping and boarding suspicious-looking boats. Typically the traffickers they intercept are from South America bound for Europe and North Africa and use speedboats packed with petrol and drugs, known as, go-fasts. Commander Newland had been told to expose the prince to every aspect of frontline operations on the ship and, as luck would have it, within four days of his arrival, they seized a massive cocaine haul from a 50-foot speedboat 300 miles northeast of Barbados. It was the culmination of a three-day operation in rough seas and stormy weather. William was part of the frigate's helicopter crew that first spotted the boat, suspiciously far out to sea for such a small craft, and after a high-speed chase, ordered it to stop. He hovered overhead while U.S. Coast Guards boarded the speedboat and arrested five men. They found 45 bales of cocaine, with a total weight of 900 kilograms and a street value of 40 million pounds, bound for Europe. Newland was full of praise for William after the raid. He is someone who contributes at every level, he said. He is a very professional military officer, and very astute. He acts as I would expect a young officer of his experience and maturity to act in this type of operation. It was the beginning of another of several important relationships for Prince William. They were absolutely outstanding with William, says a member of the household of his time on Iron Duke, and the commander of that frigate is a real genius, a charismatic sort of guy who William absolutely adored. He was treated as just another naval officer on board, who had to sleep four to a cabin, get up early, be on watch through the nights and pull his weight. A fellow crew member from Iron Duke was one of the 24 armed forces personnel chosen to line the path outside Westminster Abbey after William and Kate's wedding. Leading physical trainer Gavin Reese, who was with William throughout those five weeks, said, My abiding memory of Prince William was that he was always late for circuit training, so I always had to give him extra press-ups. Looking back on it now it's amazing to think that I took the future king for circuit training. After the excitement of the narcotics hall they went on to engage in a hurricane disaster rescue exercise on the volcanic island of Montserrat. William was involved in the planning and was a member of the forward command team who were the first Navy personnel to come ashore after an imaginary Category 5 storm hit the island. He had to help senior officers and local leaders direct the emergency operations and, according to Mark Newland, Sub-Lieutenant William Wales was a natural leader. Commanding small teams of people came as, second nature, to him. Had such a storm hit for real, it would have flattened almost all the buildings on the island and threatened the lives of hundreds of people. Just two months later, Hurricane Ike did precisely that on the Turks and Caicos Islands, and the Iron Duke was involved in a genuine relief operation. But by this time William was back on dry land. After almost two years of service life near the bottom of the pile, Carrying out strategies devised in Whitehall, William's next assignment took him on a stratospheric leap into the heart of that decision-making process. He spent a week at the Ministry of Defense on attachment to the Secretary of State, Day Brown, shadowing the staff of the Chief of Defense Staff, Air Chief Marshal Sir Jock Stirrup. William sat in on meetings with the military representative from NATO, visiting four-star generals and the like, and did not resist the temptation to join in their discussions. In meeting after meeting he was the only one around the table who had experience of all three services, and had been primed by people such as Mark Newland, commander of Iron Duke, and Ed Smith Osborne from the Blues and Royals to ask difficult questions. One of the meetings he sat in on was a discussion about the aircraft carrier program. This was, and still is, a political and financial hot potato. The decision, which came out of the new Labour government's Strategic Defence Review in 1997, to build two new supercarriers, HMS Queen Elizabeth and HMS Prince of Wales. At 280 metres long, displacing 65,000 metric tonnes and capable of deploying 40 aircraft including helicopters, they are by far the biggest warships ever to be constructed for the Royal Navy and are expected to enter service in 2016 and 2018. The original cost was estimated at £3.65 billion, 
although almost double that figure is now the cost of completing just one of the ships. They survived the latest strategic defense review cuts on the grounds that the contracts the last government signed made them more expensive to cancel than to complete. When William sat in on this meeting in September 2008, the contracts to build them had just been signed and a rather splendid air commodore had brought along a model of one of the carriers. As he was pointing out the guns on the decks, where the aircraft would take off and land and explaining that a number of technical specifications in the original plans had been stripped out because of cost, William listened quietly and then asked very politely, Sir, can I just ask one very quick question? Is the plan for these ships to be degaussed? Degaussing is a process used on every naval ship since 1917 to demagnetize the hull. It is basically a band of copper that stops magnetic mines going off underneath the ship. It was indeed one of the things they had decided to remove. The air commodore went bright red and said, Yes, we don't need it. William said, But surely, if you're not degaussed then you won't be able to go on the continental shelf. Because, obviously, magnetic mines have to sit in shallow water so they can pick up the magnetic field. And that will restrict the range of your strike aircraft by 150 nautical miles from both directions, won't it? And give you time over target of 5 minutes instead of 3 hours or whatever it is? He was voicing the concerns he had picked up from the men and women at the sharp end, whose lives were potentially being put in danger by the men in brass. The Air Commodore very quickly moved on. No further illustration was needed about the value of those commissions. He now knows how soldiers, sailors and airmen tick, each one differently from the next. He has made friends in all the services of men and women of his own age with whom he is still in regular contact, and if they stay in the services when William is commander-in-chief, his old chums will be the ones calling the shots in the corridors of power.